Well, good evening, everyone, and Happy New Year. Here we are. Kind of hard to believe, isn't it? I remember in school, I don't think I was quite in high school yet, but I sat down and calculated one day how old I would be at the turn of the century in the year 2000. And I thought, I'll never make it. Um, and, and I just barely did, but I'm really, really glad to be here uh, 20 years beyond that, amazingly so. Uh, last winter, I know this for a fact, last winter, Pastor Brett wanted to come to church wearing a, uh, a mock turtle, like just about like this. And Julie said, Brett, don't wear that. Don't wear that to church. She said, only old men wear those. So I'm here tonight to prove that young men wear them too. <laughs> Julie, please take note of that. You know, I couldn't agree more with what our pastors said this morning when they spoke of their concern regarding our preoccupation. It's just a, it's just a normal human pro proclivity. Our preoccupation with our self interest, our, our comfort, our needs. And sometimes I feel like our faith has been hijacked by greed and selfishness. We can very easily fall into the habit of coming to church with a prevailing mindset. What can you do for me today? God, hear me. Help me, give me, bless me, prosper me, serve me. There, there is a time for some of that, but, but not all the time. Sermons and songs cater to that selfishness. And very few sermons are delivered on the goodness and the greatness of God and the majesty of His Son. And when they are, we feel deprived because we've been upstaged. God got top billing instead of us. Well, you poor neglected people, you might feel a little deprived tonight because I'm going straight to Jesus, straight to his glorious victory, and will barely be giving you honorable mention before the evening is over. But I will, but I will before the evening is over. And here we go. And if you would join me, please, in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. And we're going to uh, read a couple of verses from that chapter, 1 Peter, the third chapter, and verse 18. Peter says, For Christ died for sins once for all, oh, I'm so glad that's in there, once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. This is Christ. And in verse 22, Christ who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. One thing you will note about 1 Peter, he often speaks of Christ's suffering and death. In chapter 1, verse 11, he brings into focus the sufferings of Christ. Chapter 2, verse 21, he declares, Christ suffered for you. And in the following verses, he speaks of his suffering, his body on the tree, his wounds. He mentions the Lord's suffering in every chapter. And why does he go there so often? Because he was there. He was an eyewitness to it all, and he could never forget the horror he had witnessed. It couldn't have been any worse. And he saw it all up close and personal. 
But there's another important point, and that is that Peter rarely speaks of Christ's suffering and death without telling the rest of the story. Because without the rest of the story, there is no story for us. Without the rest of the story, the story has no meaning. There's nothing left but defeat, darkness, and despair. And without the rest of the story, well, the, the truth hasn't been told. Like the prophets of old, the prophets that Peter references in chapter 1, he speaks of the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. There's nothing more hopeless than the image of a crucified Christ, a Messiah hanging on a tree with weeping women and scattered disciples and shattered dreams. Yes, Christ died, but Peter goes on to speak of the glories that would follow his suffering and death, adding one revelation after another, not of a defeated Christ, but a conquering Christ, a Christ whose victory is the victory of the ages. And the evidence of the victory of the ages, the evidence of this all-conquering Christ, well, first, this is the introduces the first third of my hour and a half sermon. First of all, his resurrection. Remember that word, his resurrection in chapter 3 and in verse 18. Uh, he was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. And in verse 21, he speaks of the resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, the only comeback from death is resurrection. Nobody says, I died, but I got over it. You know, it was just a temporary thing. They hooked, some, hooked me up to some car batteries and jump-started me. No! Death is it! Death is the last verse. It is the last chapter. It is the last hurrah! Jesus could not have been more dead, and he could not be more alive. Dead as dead can be, alive as alive can be. Dead beyond doubt, alive beyond doubt. Dead in the grave, alive in glory. This is Peter's message, and he can't go beyond the first three verses of this letter before he gets to it before he reminds these suffering, persecuted Christians that they have a living hope and a living Lord, before he proclaims what he has seen and what he knows, that Christ not only suffered and died and was buried, but he rose from the dead and he is now alive. Yes, it's there. Chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He's not making this stuff up. It was an extremely perilous day to go around preaching something like this. In fact, Peter, like his fellow apostle Paul, will be put into prison and eventually executed for his preaching of this gospel. And if he made it up, all the apostles made up the same story in identical detail, never contradicting each other. And they all died for telling the story rather than backing down from the message, the message they heralded throughout the world Jesus is alive. Now this letter was written between 60 and 63 A.D. And you backtrack 30 years, 30 years before that, 30 years earlier on the day of Pentecost, and Peter was preaching the same message. The suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We have that treasure in Acts chapter 2, and it goes like this. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to God, by God to you, by miracles, wonders, and signs, 
which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. That's the apostolic message. All the apostles preached the identical message. Jesus was put to death but has been made alive. And this makes all the difference for us, a living Lord. A living Lord inviting us into his life. A living Lord directs us, empowers us, provides for us. A living Lord anoints us in this life and awaits for us in the next life. A living Lord is our deliverance and our destiny. A living Lord gives grace now and glory forever. Well, I've been thinking about writing a hymn. Not a little chorus. No, sir, I'm talking about a majestic and glorious hymn. And, and if I do write this hymn, I'm sure that it will go in, down the, into the annals of history. It's going to be right up there with the greatest thy faithfulness and a mighty fortress is our God. Uh, I know that because the title even suggests the majesty and the glory of this possible hymn. The title would be, Don't Be a Dope. <laughs> Don't be a dope. Get in on the hope. Jesus is alive. He's on your side. Let the church say in one accord, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Don't be a dope. Live with the hope. An empty grave says he can save. Save to the uttermost. Fill with the Holy Ghost. Let the church Say in one accord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. Don't be a dope, not when there's hope. Lay aside your misery and live in victory. Victory is yours, victory is mine, victory is ours all the time. Let the church say in one accord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. He's resurrected, he is alive, he is Lord. But, now there's another picture here and it's one that we often overlook. I don't want you to overlook it. I think the church has been remiss. We have for some reason neglected it and yet it's, it's massively important. Not only his resurrection but secondly his rapture. You see Christ not only was made alive, he's not only resurrected, he ascended into heaven. He was raptured, a picture of our rapture to come. Peter says in verse 22, who has gone into heaven. And Peter, by the way, was an eyewitness of that, of this incredible event. Now, he saw the empty tomb. He saw the resurrected Jesus on multiple occasions. He talked to him. He touched him. He heard truth from him, he was restored by him after his own miserable failure, failure, failure. He sounds an awful lot like me. And he, but he saw, he saw the raptured Jesus and he wasn't alone in all of this. In fact, hundreds saw the resurrected Jesus but they also saw Jesus ascend into heaven, taken up into heaven before their very eyes. Have you ever given that much thought? This historical event, what was it like? It took place in the last meeting the Lord had with his disciples. He was giving them final instructions before his departure. And after those instructions, we are told in Acts chapter 1 that he was taken up, raptured before their very eyes. It was an event that was accompanied by angelic announcement. This same Jesus which you have seen go into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. 
And I've often wondered what that event could have been like. Do you have questions about it? Oh, I do. Like, I mean, was it really, really, was it really fast? Was it like, zoom? Was it like a rocket ship? Did you leave behind a vapor trail? What was it like? Was it like a Superman liftoff? Or, or was it slow? I mean, really, really slow. On the way up, did, did he wave? I, I, I don't know. Whatever it was, however it was, it made a lasting impact on everybody who saw it. How could Peter ever forget something like that? This was an important part of his story. He ascended into heaven where he had come from. It was just another divine confirmation, a divine exclamation mark upon who he was. This was the ultimate heavenly endorsement. His virgin birth, his baptism, his miracles, his teaching, his transfiguration, his crucifixion, his resurrection. But don't forget his ascension. Gone into heaven. Now, this is way better than beam me up, Scotty. This is not science fiction. This is not a man-made fantasy. This is not imagination, hallucination, or exaggeration. This is a divine revelation. This is all part of the gospel, chapter 1, verse 12. This is part of the imperishable, living, and enduring word of God, chapter 1, verse 23. This is part of the word of the Lord in chapter 1, verse 25. The ascension was also the confirming evidence that he who came from heaven and has returned to heaven will descend from heaven to take us to heaven. I would be remiss if I didn't mention 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. Paul said, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. His rapture. What an unforgettable image. What a dramatic depiction of his ultimate freedom from and victory over this world that crucified him. Well, there's one more picture, one more to complete the picture. Without it, there'd be so many unanswered questions like, well, what happened after his ascension? Where is Jesus now and what is he doing? And why does his ascension really matter? I'm so glad I can tell you that he's not retired. He's not gone out of business. He hasn't been voted out of office, although there's a long line of people that would love to vote him out of office. They would impeach him if they could. He is impeachable. He's not going anywhere. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is Lord of lords and King of kings. That's the way it is, and that's the way it's always going to be. He is without beginning and without end, and his reign will have no end. So let's talk about, thirdly, not just his resurrection, not just his rapture, but his reign. Peter says he has gone into heaven, and in verse 32, he's at God's right hand. There's no step above that. That is the place of honor and authority. That is the place of perfect union with the Father. And there are many New Testament passages that speak of Christ being seated at the right hand of the Father. And he is seated because his work in behalf of our salvation is done. It is finished. But perhaps no text is more beautiful than Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, 
speaking of that subject, the sun, it says, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful word, after He had provided purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. He is in heaven. He is at God's right hand. And then it says in verse 22 that not only is he at God's right hand, but he's also with angels and authorities and powers. Can you imagine? No, you can't. Neither can I. The reception they gave the crucified, conquering Christ when he ascended from earth and returned to heaven. I have a sneaking suspicion the angels know how to throw a party. The Bible says they rejoice when one sinner repents. And oh, how they must have rejoiced when their conquering king returned from his earthly mission, having proved himself faithful and obedient even unto death. He is with the heavenly host. He is with them. But he is superior to them. In fact, they worship him day and night. And Peter goes on to say they are in submission to him in verse 22. The angels are at his beck and call. They always have been. Even in the garden, even on the cross. And this is just a, a picture of the full restoration of his power and position you see, there is no doubt about who's running the universe. Suffering, put to death, but resurrected, raptured, reigning. That's why Peter says in verse 15 that Christ is Lord. He's Lord over everybody. He's Lord over everything. He's Lord of all time. Now Peter and these scattered believers, and they were scattered because of persecution, courtesy of the Roman Empire, they were expected to proclaim as members or citizens of the Roman Empire that Caesar is Lord. Nero demanded to be worshipped as a god. But Peter will not give him any such acknowledgement. You see, he... He knows too much. He's seen too much. And he says, Christ is Lord. We're talking about a resurrected, raptured, reigning Jesus. We're talking about a Jesus who met and defeated every enemy. Every enemy. Sin, death, and the grave. Enemies no one else could beat, but he beat them all. We're talking about one who descended into Hades, showed them his Jesus card, and made the pronouncement, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. We're talking about the one who passed into heaven, and he's at the Father's right hand with angels and authorities and powers in submission to him. We're talking about the all conquering Christ. And so live as though the big questions have been answered. Live as though the big issues have been resolved. Live as though the big battles have been fought and won. Pray as though you have a Christ who is Lord over all. Pray as though he has all power and authority in heaven and in earth. Pray as though in chapter 3, verse 12, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. He's on the receiving end of our prayers. Christ has won the victory. We share in that victory. Christ has overcome and he's made us more than overcomers. Christ reigns, 
and we shall reign with him. So there's an image, an image I hope you will take with you into this new year. It's not the cross, and it's not the grave, no, not by themselves, but add to these the image of the resurrected, glorified Jesus, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, powers, and all things in submission to him. And now I'm going to give you that honorable mention. When you're down, look up. When you're lonely, look up. When you're afraid, look up. When you need wisdom, look up. When you pray, look up. And see what Isaiah saw, the Lord high and lifted up. Look up and see what the author of Hebrews saw, a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. When you pray, look up and see what John saw, the one who was dead and is alive forevermore. And when you pray, look up and see what Peter saw the one who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand. Oh yeah. Happy New Year. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Well, all through the sermon, I have felt like just giving Jesus the biggest thank you and praise you and everything. Would you stand with me? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah, Lord. Our all-conquering Christ, we give you glory. We give you thanks. Lord, we give you praise. Put a spirit of faith in our hearts, for this is that which overcomes the world, even our faith. Our faith is in you, Lord, not in us. Our faith is in the risen one the raptured one, the reigning one, King of kings, Lord of lords. We thank you tonight for a little glimpse of who you are and what you have accomplished. We thank you tonight for a reminder of the one to whom we belong. Pastor Brett's going to lead us. Let's worship the Lord as we sing tonight. If you have a, if you have a need in your life and you just like to acknowledge his lordship, maybe you'll Maybe you'll prefer to come and just stand around the altar and present yourself to him tonight and say, Lord, here I am, I am yours. Forgive me for ever doubting. Forgive me for flagging in my zeal. Forgive me, Lord, for weakening and waning. Forgive me, Lord, for whining. Forgive me, Lord, for questioning even for a moment who you are and what you can do. Forgive me for forgetting the one to whom I belong. Present yourself to him, whether it's there, whether it's up front tonight, unreservedly. Give yourself to God in this new year. Lord, we thank you tonight for your sweet presence. It always brings us peace. It is a peace that passes all understanding. <clears throat> A peace this world cannot duplicate. I thank you, Lord, that we have not and we will not face a trial without your divine foreknowledge and without your divine purposes being fulfilled, our good, our growth, and your glory. Help us to be strong and faithful soldiers when we go through battles this new year. Help us to dig deep, Lord, and find the wherewithal within ourselves that we could surrender to you. And in our very dying, we will live in our surrender. We will receive from you all that you have to make a way, even when there seems to be no way. 
I thank you that the battle is the Lord's. So find us, Lord, faithful at our post of duty, just being your children, loving you, serving you, learning more about you, growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, that we will have that faith, we will have that peace, we will have that joy that is completely independent of circumstances. Keep us close to your side. Help us to hear your voice, to know your will, and to do it. To obey you out of a heart of love and gratitude, out of a heart inspired and carried along by faith. I thank you tonight, Lord, that you love us and you care for us more than any of us can imagine. And we take our little finite, insignificant hand, and we put it into the hand of omnipotence, and we say, lead on, King Jesus. Make a way where there seems to be no way. Fight our battles. Lead us in. Lead us through. We thank you tonight, Lord, that you are that kind of God, that kind of Savior. Hallelujah.